Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today I am going to be reviewing Boosh! <laughs> evil for Evil. No, this is book one, Devices and Desires by K.J. Parker. Who cares? Book one of the Engineering Trilogy. So, look at this cover. Note that it's called Devices and Desires, and like, don't have a problem reading this in public as people think you're reading a spin-off to Fifty Shades of Grey. No, no. Just a weird title. Though, the problem is the title's actually really apt. I thought the title was dumb, and then I read it, and I'm like, oh no, well, the title's actually quite appropriate. But still. Still. St and also, it's too long. Like, this book is... How long is the book? 630 pages. And guess what? Book two is like 660 or 670. Too long. Anyway, this is book one of the Engineer Trilogy, and this is the, uh, the second trilogy of Parker's that I have read. I haven't finished it yet, but I've, we've read book one and, um, one and two. If you are interested in our uh, discussion of uh, book one, it is right there. Um, but yeah, so this is this the concluding read-along for this year. Um, every... Every quarter this year, we've done a trilogy read-along, and they've all been great. Like, they have been successes. And here, um, this is the last one, and hopefully, I've already read the first two, and I've loved them as well. Uh, this is absolute, absolute, like, classic Parker. Parker at uh, really his finest, in in my opinion. And Ethan didn't like this one um, as much. It is, And yet, it is absolutely in no way the first Parker book you should read. No, 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 no. It's way too long. It's way too in-depth on the the stuff that, um, you know, he likes to focus on. He always picks something that he goes way too in-depth. There's too many, too much in this, too much in this. Start with a folding knife. Start with a folding knife. Start with a folding knife. Without wasting any more time. Let's get down to business. Let's talk about devices and desires. So, it's called devices and desires because at its core, and... And don't take this the wrong way. It's not a romance book at all. But love is at the core, and various kinds of it, is at the, the, the core of the story. And that's where the, the, the desires part comes from. And the devices are the mechanisms that we all put in place in order to achieve our goals. And in, in a larger way, the mechanisms that are put in place to reach an outcome that you may or may not see coming, but it doesn't matter if you see it coming because... It is how we get there, and you can't look away. You can't look away of just the exercise in human misery that is the Engineer trilogy. It's it's probably the most depressing of his books that I've read. Parker is normally bleak and cynical in a lot of ways, but in this one, every like every breath of fresh air, every like daisy that pops through the the ground after the rain is soon taken from you. Um, <laughs> there is nothing that you can idolize. There's nothing that you can really value. Uh, all values are seen as negatives in in this particular <laughs> this particular series, um, and everyone is just the worst. But while they're busy being the worst, they have moments of you know what? Maybe you're not the worst. Oh no no no, <laughs> you're the worst. Regardless, uh, it's about it's about different kinds of love, different kinds of relationships. At the heart of this, there are four men. Three of them in love in various ways with the same woman. We have uh, Duke Valens, who w the novel opens up with Valens as a child, and he is the or as a teenager, and he is the um, the son of the Duke of the Vidani, of Kiwitas, Kiwitas Vidanis. There's been a long war between their neighboring country, um, Kiwitas Aremia, and they've signed a peace treaty, and one of the noble princesses is is held hostage in um, in Wadanis, and he is he is attracted to her, and they have like one interaction when they're young. And he is he remains with that picture of her as a 17-year-old in, in in his head. And they maintain a correspondence. She, however, is married to uh, the Duke of Aremia, Duke Orsea, who is just a, a walking 
failure. Everything he touches just doesn't work. The very first thing we see of him is that he has destroyed his country's army by going against uh, the Mezentines, whom I'll get to in a second. And he is very much in love with his wife, but he is just this put-upon, woe is me, just sucks the air out of room. Like, uh, he's, <laughs> sounds like me when I'm witching and moaning about it. I don't have any time and, and, you know, I'm useless and all that kind of stuff. He's like the living embodiment of low self-esteem. And then we have Duke Orsea's best friend, uh, Mille Ducas, uh, the Ducas, which is uh, like, a, like a ruling noble, but is less than the Duke. He's just the most prominent noble family within Eremia, Mille Ducas. And he is extremely loyal. He has a lot of love for his friend, but his friend is a dunce. And just, he's just whiny, and Mille Ducas tries to mitigate that, and he also has affection for uh, Beatriz, or Saya's wife, because for most of their life, they were betrothed, and she ended up having to marry Orsea because at the time, when it finally came down to it, uh, she was the heir to the actual, like, to an actual massive noble family, and it would have consolidated too much power for the Ducas and her to marry, so she ends up marrying Orsea, who was a minor noble, and so we have these three guys, all of whom have affection for Beatriz in one way or another. And that's not really what the plot is about, but this is what these people are dealing with as the story goes on. We see these very, like, someone fantasizing about a relationship that never existed. Someone who loves his wife but is convinced that she couldn't possibly love him. And someone who is torn between these dual loyalties, one to, or like, to Orsea and also to Beatriz, um, both of whom he's known his entire life. And now enter the Mezentines. What I love about this book is, unlike any other Parker book so far, we learn so much about a specific society. This is, if you've, if you've seen me talk about Parker before, one of my favorite things he does is, is when he gets all sociological and anthropological, and he talks about a whole society. In, what, in the second Cyrus Corax novel, um, there is, he just goes in this big long thing about this civilization that, you know, kills people if you come in a thing, and they're just completely, like, cut off from the rest of the world because no one lives. You, you, if you're not one of the Heshai, you can't cross it. They'll get you. And here we learn so much about the what's called the Perpetual Republic, the Mezentine Republic. It is a finely tuned machine, a device, if you will, where everything is governed by specifications and everybody is a cog in the wheel of government, in the wheel of bureaucracy, in the wheel of manufacturing. And our ostensibly main character that incites everything is... Ziani Vaatsis, who is a foreman of, he is a foreman of one of the foundries, and he makes a toy for his daughter, like a mechanical doll for his daughter, and inside he has made it better, and because of that, he has violated specifications. And because the Mezentines have specific ways that everything can work. By doing this, he has committed an abomination and he is put on trial and he barely escapes with his life and flees and winds up in Eremia where he has all of the knowledge of Mezentine tech and the Mezentines cannot let that stand. And so that is where all everything intersects with all of these different things playing off one another. And then, of course, Ziani's love for his wife. His primary motivation is how can he find a way to get home and be with his wife again? At least that is ostensibly what we are told. And everything goes from there. And you can just imagine the way all of these forces work together and against each other. And it is hard to tell at times uh, where things are going to go. I actually thought it was going one way for a time, and then at the end, it didn't go that way at all, and I was not happy. I didn't like at all that we had gone that way. I was very upset that it had gone this way instead of the way that I thought it was going to go, because I was so excited to see this conclusion, and I got a completely different conclusion that I didn't like at all. But I understood why it happened, and it's just like, okay, well, I guess we'll... 
read almost 700 pages of book two and see if, you know, what I want to happen will happen. No, no, it's not gonna happen there either. <laughs> Exercise in Human Misery is this book. So right off the bat, I have now, without, the sh without a shadow of a doubt, I like Parker's third person works better than his first person works. Um, the first person works all tend to have a similar a similar flavor, a similar feel, and and yeah, that's just Parker. Like Parker has a, has a um, a certain way of of writing and a certain way of characterizing that is common to much of his works. But the first person ones, especially, um, mostly because they're in his novellas. Almost every one of his novellas is in the first person, and so it, it's a lot of the um, a similar kind of character uh, that appears. In those, and so in the trilogy of Silas Korax, which is first person, I liked it, but it it, it did feel very Saloninus esque, but not quite as brilliant. But I have loved all of the third person books that I've read. All the standalones are in third person, and this trilogy is in third person. And I like that he's able to explore different uh, POVs, which he's not able to do in those first person ones because this story couldn't be told from one person's perspective. Like, it just couldn't. It could not be told from one person's perspective. So getting all of, getting into the head of, of Ziani, um, of getting in the head of the four main guys that I've already talked about, but as well as Ziani's wife, Beatriz, or Seiya's wife, getting into the head of the head of the bureaucracy, uh, Pacellus, at, um, back in Mezentia, the one put in charge of understanding uh, Ziani's inner mind to figure out what he's gonna do and, you know, how they can get the best of him. Um, from even, even one of the mercenary generals that's hired who despises maps and is constantly cursing people who made maps and imaginary streams that people put on maps that when he gets there aren't there. He freaking hates them so much. Just these random POVs. And he's not able to do that in, these first, in the first person ones, and that's one of the reasons that this works so well for me. And coming back to that theme of different ways love is expressed and the different kinds of love, uh, in this book, love is very much portrayed as a weakness. If you love something, that is something that can be used against you. It waxes big about how all of human misery can be stemmed from from humans' love of other things and of people. And without love, there would be no catastrophes. And because this this is focused on Ziani of, of the Mesentines, everything is described in this very mechanical way about how everything is a mechanism or everything is a device. And this idea of, of human beings and their desires are really just are just mechanisms in this in this large machine and everyone you you plug in what people want here to get a cog to turn over there and it's just about manipulating people uh based on based on their desire and their love for other things and with these mechanisms this book is also about technology and you know you can pick whatever lesson you want to learn from from the tech warning here about how technology can change it can change societies. It can change the way you fight wars, but is the trade-off worth it for how it can transform society? Because you can't can't put that genie back in the bottle once um, a society has evolved based on this tech. This is something that I really loved in, in Tchaikovsky's uh, Shadow of the App series about the evolution of how war is kind of the impetus for technological advancement. Um, in fact, the Mezentines even have, the only time that specifications are even a little flexible is uh, in war, with upgrading war machines. So what does uh, advancement in tech do to societies? What does it do to other people? And is that trade-off worth it? There's constantly this comparison between the Mezentines and uh, the savages as Parker always explores the uh, the idea between civilization and savages, and here the savages are the the Vadani and the uh, Eremians, and and this idea of how one group of people adapts things to suit the people to serve the people, while the other group adapts the people adapt to serve the things themselves to serve technology, and it's just it's really. Parker's done a great thing here with giving us the kind of fish out of water perspective uh, with Ziani, uh, how he views, he just views these uncivilized, 
you know, plebs, even though they're royalty, because they're not as advanced technologically as the mezzanine. And piling on that, the fascinating thing is just the, the, the hardcore clinical way that Ziani views everything. He views everything with an engineer's mind, uh, with that mezzanine, just mechanical mindset. He sees everything, including the people around him, as uh, mechanisms to in in a larger machine. And he sees the the Vidani and the Aremians as inferior parts because they're not as civilized. And he has to rely on. Um, inferior parts that he would normally never rely on if he were back in in Mezentia. And, and Ziani is constantly also thinking about um, what is called tolerance. In, in Mezentia, there's like a very, very small amount either way that it can go that is within specifications. And here in Eremia or Vadani, when, when they make stuff, it's just like they say good enough or when something happens, it's good enough. And he cannot grasp the concept of this overindulgence in tolerance, how there's no such thing as good enough. Either something is right or something is wrong. Like either it is made correctly or it's not made correctly at all. There is no, this is made good enough. And he really struggles with uh, dealing with that. There's also this, and you guys know, I love explorations of loyalty and duty. And in this there, it's wonderful explorations of toxic duty and toxic loyalty. And this is a common um, theme in, in Parker novels uh, uh, about how the only, the people that get ahead are the ones who don't play by the rules when everyone else is playing by, by a set of, of hardcore rules, which is really uh, ironic considering how many rules govern uh, Mezentia. But Mil Dukas especially is this incredibly loyal friend to Orsea, and he can't even he can't even think about not doing the right thing. He was in love with Beatriz uh, before he uh, before their marriage took place, and it, it never even occurred to him to object or or to not um, serve Orsea, who he's known you know forever loyally. Now that Orsea is the Duke. For the Ducas, for Mille Ducas, it, it is, it's just not something you do. Like, you can't fathom not doing the right thing. And that really dovetails nicely into Parker's exploration of agency in this book. And do people have choices, or is everyone part of this great machine of destiny where no one really had any options at all. And it all stems from a single choice that Ziani makes, and that is to escape rather than taking his punishment um, at the beginning. Uh, we have Valens, who never chose to be the Duke. His dad died, and he, uh, he, had to, he became Duke and had to take it over. Uh, Beatrice, who never had any choice on who she was supposed to marry. She was engaged to one, and then... Uh, was forced to marry Orsea, whom she loves, but never. she didn't get to choose that. She did not choose him. He was chosen for her. And so Valens, in the, the letters that they exchange, represents kind of this, it's the only thing she can choose to do. Uh, Mille Dukas has never been able to choose anything in his life because the Dukas' job is to support the Duke and do whatever is required of him. And that is what a good noble does. And so we see how expectations set upon you are define the way you feel about things. Where with Mille Dukas, um, because perfection is expected of him, he resents it because, you know, he has to do this, it's required this, 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 this. Where with Ziani, perfection means that he's closer to his people. He relishes that perfection because that makes him part of a community, which it does the same thing for Mille Dukas, that having, uh, having to behave that certain way makes him part of that community. But because he's been, it's been forced on him, he resents being part of that rather than Ziani, who strives for that so he can be considered part of, uh, part of the group, part of the, the in crowd. And I think we deal with this a lot uh, in our own lives. Um, how our expectations can be either uh, can be crushing or they can be liberating. It's, it's said in, in more than one Parker book and in here and certainly in the second book as well, when nothing is expected of you, it's a kind of freedom in a way because all of your agency is there, because no one expects anything from you. Anyway, I could talk and talk and talk, talk more about this. It is a fascinating character study, guys. A fascinating character study. I would not start with Parker here because the amount it goes into forging, Parker goes into incredible detail. Forging, 
factory work, just like in the hammer, um, hunting, falconing, so much, guys. So everything you ever wanted to know about hunting, everything you ever wanted to know about forging something, uh, making anything out of metal, like any anything you want to know that, like, boom, pages of it, guys. And I love that crap. Not for the faint of heart, though. So don't let this be your first Parker. But if you've read Parker and, you know, you, you, you've gotten a little taste and you want some more, I definitely, definitely recommend this. So many good quotes. I usually uh, close Parker Parker reviews with quotes, but we talked about a bunch from up there in the in the live show if you want to go watch that. There are spoilers, so you should probably read it before you do that. Anyway, guys, Device and Desires, I strongly recommend it. Wonderful book. Um, evil for Evil is just as good, if not better. Uh, hopefully, I'll have a review of that one as well, just because they're different enough to where it just requires talking about. Um, at any rate, guys... Uh, have you read Evil for Evil? I, like, I give this, like, whatever. Five stars. Like, five stars. It's so good. Like, it's so good. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, one of my favorite books of the year, for sure. So, if you've read it, comment down there. Let me know what you think. Don't spoil the third book, please. 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 Um, and, guys, that's all I have for today. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description. And I'll see you next time, guys. Mm -hmm.